Hi everyone, welcome to Gellin's Guys podcast with me, Natasha. And Connie. And I sometimes go by Nat. I sometimes go by Michelle. So hey everyone, welcome to this very special episode of Gellin's Guys podcast. We have a great guest in store for you today. Um, she describes herself as a hopeful Zimbabwean. Some people would refer to her as the most influential young female politician in Zimbabwe currently. She's a law lecturer. She's a constitutional lawyer. She's currently the MDC Education, Sports, Art and Culture Secretary. So please sit back, relax and enjoy this episode with Fadzaya Mahere. Hi Fadzaya, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure, ladies. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I've been looking forward to doing this all week. Um, so it's great to be here. Thank no, you. Thank you. So I think just to kind of get to launch straight into it, like, how, how are you? I don't know if the, you get asked that question, like, um, <laughs> a woman, you've got so much, to, got so many people who look up to you. You are already like a political figure. So how are you and how has the lockdown Okay, so I, I th I'm doing great. So at a personal level, I'm fine. I've been very careful about, you know, protecting my, my mental space and trying to make the most out of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And obviously finding ways to channel my frustration towards positive action as well. Um, so that, you know, I don't get sucked in by the gloom and doom. So mm -hmm. at a personal level, I'm good. And also the courts have opened up. So it's nice to get a bit routine in. As for the strict lockdown itself, obviously Zimbabwe's moved to level two, but prior to that, we're on a very strict lockdown. And I think that's where, you know, <laughs> everybody had an opportunity to introspect, to reflect. And yeah. for me, it was a great time. It was a great time to reset, mm -hmm. you know, start getting my sleep patterns in place again, start reassessing whether the pace at which I was living my life was the correct one. And also just starting to get a control over everything and taking a moment to stop and smell the flowers and see what birds come into your garden yeah. Yeah. etc also just um so i'm internally driven obviously but you know i think for everyone it was an opportunity to to spend some time with yourself which i don't think we do enough you know you you can't yeah. hide you can't go to a restaurant you can't go yeah. to a party you can't go see your friend you're just by yourself in your yeah. home space yeah. No, for but me it was fantastic. <laughs> that's good to know that yeah. there's been some positivity um, in in all this because it, it's it's quite um, it's it's frightening. I think it's quite scary with everything that's that's going on. But can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about what it's like on the ground? Because myself and Nat were both like in London, and for us, right. lockdown has meant like complete lockdown. Like, you know, lockdown. Yeah. But what has and it's a little bit frustrating, I guess, when we're calling people at home and like I was speaking to my family uh, one of my uncles is like oh I'm going to the market I'm like how are you going to the market when it's locked down? <laughs> it's just trying to get so, a bit of an understanding what, uh, it's like, what it means so I, for think, I think the circumstances Zimbabwe finds itself in are very different from say London mm -hmm. um Rome Barcelona New York um the virus hasn't touched wood yet hit as hard as it might um and so we don't have like the hectic hospitalization like people completely you know falling apart and i think that's partly because we've got a young population partly because we don't have as much travel you know between harare Bulawayo, and other uh you know global capitals you don't have people you know cramming up in a tube every morning Mm -hmm. so there are factors that have sort of slowed down the virus just by the fact of our dis I say that advisedly. Um, at the same time, I, I think I would caution against, you know, uh, people being complacent. Hmm. I think with infectious diseases in a jurisdiction like Zimbabwe, we've seen it with typhoid, we've seen it with tuberculosis, we have to be extra careful because it just takes one outbreak to really start a complete disaster. So, you know, wherever I am, I really impress upon people to respect social distancing stay at home if you can like you don't need to be out in a bar don't you know do your groceries once a week and when you're at work practice social distancing when you're outside 
put on your mask, try not to endanger other people, have your sanitizer all the time, wash your hands with water. So all the ordinary safeguards. But I must say, especially since um, businesses opened up, at least partially, there has been a sense of, you know, things are back to normal <laughs> here in Zimbabwe. But obviously they're not. There are lots of businesses that haven't opened yet. So obviously the restaurant, entertainment industry haven't opened up yet. Schools haven't opened up and there's this push towards distance learning. Mm-hmm. And also um, informal trade. So we, we, we must remember that this is a country where, you know, the majority of people have to, you know, they live from hand to mouth, from mm-hmm. day to day. So they need to be out on the street and the current measures mean that they can't. So, you know, there's a whole section of society that is obviously reeling and has become even more vulnerable than they were previously because of these lockdown measures. So I think that's a summary of what's going on on the ground. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good summary because um, I did want to touch on the cash economy and the fact that most people are informal traders, but I think you touched on that really well. Yes. Um, so, I mean... I guess there's no sort of like nice way to kind of segue into this, but what we've seen online in the news is, you know, the really devastating pictures, images of the three MDC women, Joanna, Cecilia, and I, um, you know, who've gone through horrendous things. And I know you posted that you've seen them, you've spoken to them. So just wanted to find out, because it's quite scary sort of like seeing that, um and you know seeing that this violence is still going on you know you know you you spoke to them how are they you know what what's actually happening on the ground so they are not great Mm. Uh, let's not even beat about the bush i won't mince my words on that they are traumatized um and scarred for life um you know just going there and spending time with them was traumatizing. I left the hospital like twitching. Um, I think, you know, it really is an opportunity for women to pause and reflect and think about how vulnerable women are when you've got a country that's given to, um, you know, brutalizing opponents. Women are particularly vulnerable. Um, There's the sexual abuse Mm -hmm. aspect, which makes the torture like a million times worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, I won't go into the details, obviously, out of respect for the victims, they come first, but, you know, horrific acts Mm -hmm. were perpetrated against them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I saw them in hospital, they just break out into tears. So you're talking to someone and then they just stop like, not crying, but wailing. Um, He's Zimbabwean, so you know what that, what literally wailing and having flashbacks and, you know, you know when someone is having a panic panic attack Mm -hmm. and be in the process of having it and, you know, you're witnessing them there. And then, you know, you still have the police guarding their room. So they're, they're very scared about that because the, the people who perpetrated the violence on them said to them that, you know, we're going to keep following you. You know, this is not over. So, you know, sometimes worse to have these people still there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, just what happened to them, you know, being thrown into a dark pit in the night, sack over your head, you know, taken to a strange location, you drive for hours, Mm -hmm. um, being denied, you know, uh, an ablution, so no toilets, so you're constantly, you know, using the loo on yourself, being asked to urine, to, you know, eat each other's feces. It's like the most egregious, um, egregious violations of them. And then, I have to say that the last time that I came across sexual offenses of that nature was when I worked for the UN Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Just the, I I don't want to go into detail, like I said, Mm -hmm. but um, the kind of rape, and there are levels to to rape. There are certain things that aggravate Mm -hmm. um, these circumstances. So we, we really need to look inward as a society, um, 
is, is this who we've become? And just how outraged are we prepared to be about this? You know, um, it, it, it cannot be business as usual when women are brutalized like this. Um, for me, it's very close to home. These are my colleagues. Mm. They're, you know, my colleagues in the party. So nobody is safe, you know. And, um, you know, we always talk about women participation in politics. Why aren't more women coming in? Why aren't more young women coming in? Mm. This is a prime example of an obstacle that women face because everyone will look at this and be like, you know what, I'm not going to put myself in this position. Mm. Of course, we must be courageous, but our courage must not um, be used against us yeah, to, yeah. you know, just make these points that are completely inhuman, mm. you know, torture, um, crimes against humanity, things that should really shock the conscience, not only of the nation. I think anyone, you know, hearing the story from anywhere should really be alarmed that, you know, these things are happening. And... What makes it a little bit more worse, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going on and no, on that's here, fine. but, Please you know, just days after they'd been taken, and remember, they were taken by the police, so it's not as though they disappeared from their homes mm. by some, you know, random occurrence. It's the police that took them, and the first stop was the police station, Harare Central. Mm. So the police really have to answer for what, what transpired, what then, you know, how they then landed into some other person's hands. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we need to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. Um, you know, it shouldn't be one of those instances where it happens and we forget about it. The outrage has to continue because we, you know, just one of these incidents is one too many. Mm. So if it's, I, are, are you scared? Does that, does this give you pause for, um, you know, do you think about, you know, this could happen to me? I think, um, you know, prior to this, since I got into politics you know, around 2016, I've always known that, you know, um, you know, Zimbabwe is an extremely difficult, mm -hmm. um, you know, political environment to operate in. There are huge dangers and there are numerous examples of people who've been brutalized by the system and you know it's evident that nobody is safe um at the same time you know they i have a different kind of fear around you know just how far zimbabwe can go in terms of its capacity to fail and the fact that rock bottom doesn't really exist here things get worse and worse and worse and worse and people just adapt 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 um so mm. that fear lives with me you know am i able Am, am I going to be able to raise my kids here? Mm. Are they going to be able to live a decent life? Are they going to be able to aspire, to dream, to have decent jobs, you know? Um, and, you know, all the other fears that, that exist around safety have always been subordinate to that fear. Mm. Um, but, you know, after what happened on Friday and after I, you know, it just, just looking at it, these are women just like me. These are women in the MDC just like me. These women are young, educated, smart, just like me. You know, there's really nothing that makes me special and makes me believe that I'm, I'm particularly safe. So, can, so can, you know, sure. Can I ask you, like, I think moving forward, like what changes can we expect in regards to looking after women in politics? Because I think this is something that's quite significant and there's obviously been a lot more that has happened atrocities have been committed towards women in politics but how do you see the next few months next few years changing because of this incident so i think the first thing um is we need to speak out very strongly mm -hmm. remember you know we we must not blame the victim so you shouldn't say, you know, women need to do this. Yeah. You know, I have got a, a constitutional right to personal security, to dignity. So it's not about me, you know, having a million security guards around me. You know, that then shifts the onus uh, to women and to, you know, you become a victim even before you are one. Mm. Just like rape culture, that would be tantamount to saying, you know, women shouldn't wear certain things because that's what makes them get raped. So I, I do think that we must be very honest. We must have courageous conversations with the system that allows this sort of thing to happen and say, you know what, this is unconscionable. Mm. You remember when that incident of femicide happened in South Africa? You know, women just stood up and said, you know what, it cannot be business as usual. 
yes. they want audience with the president. This is not okay. And that's the, that's where we, that's the threshold we need to reach. That's what should be happening in the next few months because nobody is safe. Yeah. Nobody is safe. I mean, a few months ago, they were after a comedian. Prior to that, they were after just, and you know, someone who does UN conferences, you know, nobody is safe. Yeah. You know, so it's not something you can insulate yourself against and say, oh, you know, um, I'm not on Twitter attacking the government. I'm not in the MDC. I don't go to protest, so I'm safe. Mm-hmm. Nobody is safe. You know, the idea is to brutalize, to, to instill a culture of fear into mm-hmm. Zimbabweans. And, you, you know, the fact that it can happen for me is enough reason for us to stand up and say, no, this is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, and just... So something else that I wanted to get your take on is the MDC. Uh, so we've read, um, you know, what the court has said, um, what's happening with Chamisa, with Togazani Kupe. Um, what is your take and where do we stand? Because ZANU P- so the hashtag ZANUPF must go has been gaining traction. But yes. if ZANUPF goes... Who is who is replacing them? MTC Alliance, MTC T, another iteration of MTC. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And you know what I just wish to impress upon everyone is that you know Zimbabwe is not a normal jurisdiction. So it's not politics the way it is in the UK, where you've got the mm-hmm. Labour Party and the Conservatives, and they just go at each other in Parliament. This is a country. That has got a history, not only of war, but of violence, of brutality, of exterminating political rivals. You know, we are entrenched in a system where the government will stop at nothing to try and eliminate opponents um, by death, by political manipulation, using state institutions. Mm -hmm. So with that, it's not surprising that the MDC is under the sort of attack that it's under. And obviously, you know, what's happening with, you know, the, the Supreme Court judgment and the recourse from Parliament mustn't be divorced from the torture we saw against these women. It's all part of the same system of attack, trying to, you know, really break the spirit of the opposition. And I think the worst thing that could ever happen to Zimbabwe is to return us to a one-party state where, you know, the government and those in power are not subject to any scrutiny or not subject to any checks and balances. You know, there's a political class that believes that only they are entitled to rule, the constitution is not supreme. They will do anything to ensure that that happens, that they're able to loot and steal without anyone asking. So, you know, that is the background. That's the useful canvas that will help us understand what's happening in the MDC. And when I joined um, in 2019, (laughs) you know, I was under no illusions that it was going to be an easy road. And I've sat down with President Chamisa on a a number of occasions and other colleagues in the parties, both lawyers and non-lawyers. We we never expect an easy road. Mm -hmm. We expect all these curveballs because we know that ZANU-PF will stop at nothing. Mm -hmm. They want to entrench themselves in, in power. These are the same people who went as far as, you know, taking arms in 2017 to ensure that they continue. So, you know, it's not surprising if they could do that to one of their own, what more people who oppose them. It's not surprising, but, but the good news is we need to keep fighting. You know, we have to keep fighting. We, we will continue to punch and punch and punch. And just as it takes place in a boxing match, you keep landing punches. You don't know which will be the fatal one. So we just have to keep going. We must never give up because, you know, we're doing it for country. You know, I can't stand our government, but I absolutely love Zimbabwe. You know, I love the people. I love the culture. It's home. Yeah. You know, you don't choose. You don't choose your heritage. You know, it's just something you're born with. And, you know, there, there are many times, many moments, many instances, many ways in which Zimbabwe is the best, best place on earth. Yeah. It's just unfortunate that what's going to make the news is these abductions because they're so egregious, but there is a community of people who are just so kind, yeah. so generous, so civic-minded. You know, a crisis hit. When the cyclone came, for example, Zimbabweans came together in a phenomenal way. Mm. You know, yeah. that is the best of the Zimbabwean spirit. Mm. And, you know, you just say to yourself, you know, imagine if this country was properly led, you know, with these sort of people, with the literacy, with the human resources, with the resilience, um, 
where would we be? So hard working. You see Zimbabweans in the UK, you see Zimbabweans in South Africa, you see Zimbabweans in LA and New York doing amazing things. And you're like, if only these bankers were back home, if only these health workers were back home, if only these, you know, hospitality industry specialists were back home, if these teachers yeah. were back home, you know, so that's yeah, that's how so, I look at it. One day we will be fine. And yeah. the MD science obviously you have to politics is a game of numbers mm -hmm. you know i mean i can't hold on to the fact that i ran as an independent and lost but still claim that i'm somehow the best if you yeah. don't win the election you don't have the mandate of the people and that's what democracy entails it's the will of the people the will of the people must always be respected above the will of institutions of political elites it's the people who must mm. always come first and we should never take the people out of our politics and just to follow up on that, I, I, I do agree with you that politics is a game of numbers. Is it also subject to rules, constitution? And the reason I ask that is I just wanted to, um, I, I don't know, do you agree or disagree that the MDC um, mishandled, you know, Togazani Kupe, um, because according to their constitution, because if we're going to, you know, talk about, the constitution and the government not yes. upholding the constitution did mdc Absolutely. not do that at some point i think that's a fantastic question and just to answer it directly and then to explain of course yes. rules matter of course the rule of law supreme constitutions matter um it's important however to not twist that principle for political expedience um you'll recall that the first illegalities took place you know back when Shangirai was alive um yeah. and you know the people who are now wanting to take advantage of that were completely complicit in what took place there you know i there's no we're talking about the welshman movie um, i'm not the welshman movie i'm talking about when the two vice presidents elias mudzuri and um nelson chamis were appointed and yes. even after that took place you saw that douglas monzora continued in the party he didn't stand up to Changirai and say, look, we've got a, a constitutional issue here. It's only mm -hmm. because it's convenient now. You'll see that the very same Wanzora, the very same Komichi participated in the, the, the Congress. They ran. In fact, originally Douglas Wanzora was running for leader of the party. He then, you know, stepped back when he didn't get any nominations and said, I'm running for secretary general. If he, he, if he was sincere in his belief that all of this was an unconstitutional project, what was he doing? If he had won, would he be taking the same stance? You know, mm -hmm. so there is a need to be alive to that and also to just get technical as a lawyer. You know, the, yeah. the law of voluntary associations is very important here. Mm -hmm. So when you've got a voluntary association, let's say you've got a church, and if you do go to church, the question I'll ask is, do you know about your church's constitution? Uh, a lot of the time it will have one, but if people stand up and all agree that, you know, we're going to do X, you know, that mm. constitutes a variation of the constitution if everyone is unanimous. If you say you're going to elect your leader and you don't do it by a particular time, but then you go on to have a Congress that ratifies something, that is competent as a matter of law. What's also important is that every person, every entity has a right to be heard. It's common cause that the MDC Alliance was never a party to the proceedings before the Supreme Court. How do you affect, as a court, the rights and interests of persons who aren't before you? I mean, surely going back to the constitution, natural justice even, that everybody has a right to be heard, you know, before yeah. an independent and impartial court to, to put their case across. So it's not as simple as, oh, you broke the rules and so, you know, mm -hmm. there, there are complexities there, but what is the cautionary tale? The cautionary tale is, you know what, never again. Let's stick okay. to those rules. Let's be sticklers for the rules, you know? And, you know, people hate lawyers because lawyers are always like, are oh, the law, are oh, the law. <laughs> but I think now, you know, lawyers may be vindicated because they'll say, you know, we are sticklers for these things. And the law sometimes can be, can feel cumbersome, can feel inconvenient, but let's stick to it so that we're never in this position again, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but remember that political matters must be solved politically mm, makes sense it's not for a court to determine who your leader is mm. that voluntary association has got the power to decide who its leader is 
the court might not like the leader. Yeah. The system might not like the lead, leader, but if that voluntary association, remember the MDC as the political party is a voluntary association. They've got the right not only to make their own rules, but to choose their leader. I think what's mm. completely incompetent is for someone to impose a leader, number one, who ran against them mm -hmm. in the election. Mm -hmm. Remember, I mean, if we're going to go legal, we have to go all the way. What's the validity of the election that took place? You had mm -hmm. MDCT running against the MDC alliance. Now suddenly you wish to conflate them because it's politically opportune and convenient to exterminate and divide and rule. Mm -hmm. So we have to be honest about what's going on. You know, we can't look at this only from the prism of the law. We have to also look at the political terrain, the background, what's going on. You know, there was a contest about Mnangagwa's legitimacy. The MDC has continuously, you know, questioned that. So obviously this is a stratagem in my respectful view for them to also, you know, uh, cast a shadow on Nelson Chamisa's legitimacy, eye for an eye. And also you remember the MDC MPs, the Alliance MPs were boycotting the president's arrest, uh, addresses in parliament. So this is mm -hmm. them hitting back and saying, oh, you'll disrespect us in parliament, we'll kick you out. So all of that, you know, and yeah. I say as a lawyer that not everything, um, you know, all disciplines matter in analyzing what's transpiring. Yeah. I hope no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. He speaks, I and mean, I love the, the passion that you use when you're speaking about politics. And it sounds like quite, a, it's like a terrain, isn't it? I think you even use that word in that this is so complex, there is so much going on politically in Zimbabwe. How do you think us in the diaspora, how can we engage with Zimbabwe, with Zimbabwean politics? Because just as you have just spent the last few minutes explaining just how MDC, MDCT kind of alliances and from the law context and all these things, how can we engage with that? Because, you know, you're right in that in the, the, the politics in, in UK, for example, it's very, you know, it's, it seems to me very kind of straightforward. You know, you've got the labor, you've got the, you know, but then in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe seems to be a lot more complicated. So how can we engage without constantly, you know, you mentioned as well, like that it's just, you're constantly fighting, you constantly yeah. getting punched, getting down, picking yourself up again. But how is that engagement going for us in the diaspora? So for, for the diaspora, the first Point that I wish to make, and I think is the most important one, is before you're diasporan, you are Zimbabwean. Mm -hmm. And whatever rights flow from the constitution flow to, the, flow to all Zimbabweans, regardless of where they, they're located. So, you know, you are a citizen, even though you're abroad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first challenge is to try and get that diaspora vote you should be allowed to vote from the diaspora. Mm. You know, the postal vote happens, you know, it's allowed for ambassadors and that, that should be expanded. You see Rwanda doing it, you see South Africa doing it. You know, we mm -hmm. call ourselves educated, it can't be that difficult. Uh, and don't let them try and divide us. You mm. know, oftentimes I see these fights, you know, Zimbabweans in the diaspora, Zimbabweans back home, yeah. we are one at the end of the day. Mm. Uh, whether you've left and you're in London or Paris or whatever it is, you know, you will still have your ties here, whether it's Absolutely. your family, whether it's your heritage, whether it's the culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't let anyone make you feel that you are other, you know, and you, you're any less Zimbabwean. There is a duty, just like there is for every other citizen, even the ones who are here, to engage. I think disengagement could be the most dangerous thing for us as Zimbabweans, like slipping into apathy where we don't engage. And, you know, oftentimes people are, you know, having a go at each other, whether it's online or on TV or in writing. And I'm like, you know, what? this is good. It's good for people to actually be interested enough to, you know, quest and to make a point and to have points of view, even if they're divergent. That's the nature of democracy. Mm. Um, so to con continuously check and to continuously engage, to push for the vote and to also express your view on issues. Mm. You know, we're always, for the longest time, diaspora and remit remittances have mm. held this economy together. You mm. know, let's not joke about that. We've got a whole community of Zimbabweans that looks after us here ensures that we've got the forex. So, you know, they can't be just good for the remittances and then not have any voice, no agency, no right to vote. Mm. You know, so I think there needs to be a bit more activism by 
by the diaspora, insistence on yeah. being heard. And I do see it um, from time to time, especially when we get close to, to elections. So I would say, you know, uh, if you're in the diaspora, you know, you are just a Zimbabwean and continue to fight because you want to come home, whether it's at Christmas or the summer, to a Zimbabwe that's functional. You don't want to come yeah. to Zimbabwe that, where there's no electricity. You know, you've got new kids and your kids are like, mom, we hate it here. There's no water. The roads suck. There's nowhere to go. Yeah. You want it to be a Zimbabwe that's respectable so that when your kids say, oh, mom, this is where you come from. You're like, yes. You know, they're nice gardens. They're nice, you know, nice areas. It's if you have to send your kid to school in Zimbabwe for a few years, it's something that, you know, is doable because the system is functioning. Um, and also remember that the space for Zimbabwean abroad is shrinking. You know, with Brexit, it's, it's tough enough to be Polish in the UK. Oh, yeah. It's tough enough to be Black yeah. American yeah. in Trump's America. What more, you know, for Zayma here? So we, we also need to be realistic. And, you know, South Africans don't want us. I mean, we always complain when the xenophobia flares up. But I think we, we also you know, are reluctant to ask the difficult questions about, okay, what are we doing to sort out our own circumstances back home to ensure that, you know, where we are local, we're respected and we can live lives of dignity. Very true. So just yeah. one follow-up from me. So on the diaspora sure. vote, um, I think I, I have seen efforts from different individuals in different ways of pushing for the vote. But I do mm -hmm. think that you know, we need the political bully pulpit. Um, so is this something that MDC um, has on its agenda? Because for me, I think that's probably the vehicle that we need to push so the vote. So I think the, the MDC does have it on its agenda, but, you know, it, it is less forceful if I'm clamoring for the diaspora vote than when some people in the diaspora associate and say look we as diasporans have gathered and said this so the activism has to work both ways so it's about yeah. those in the diaspora wanting it because if we pushed for it and there was no uptake for example we're left with egg on our faces or, or diaspora and say you know what, i'm not interested in voting so it's one of those issues where we certainly need to work together and the work must include legal action but it should also include like genuinely protesting Mm. You know, mm. going out onto the street and saying, we demand that vote. We demand but, but, the right to be heard. Yeah. Do, do we need an MP to, you know, lay in Parliament, for example? So, I mean, is yes and no. Way? I say yes and no, because part of being in Parliament is being in Parliament. And if you're in the diaspora, you can't also be in Parliament. So of course, you can use online mechanisms and so on. Um, mm. But, you know, it's something that, that needs to be thought about. How do you ensure representation? You know, is this MP then going to be living in Zimbabwe? Are they going to be living abroad? You know, no, I, so yeah, I'm referring to... So, sorry for that. So I'm referring to an MDC MP. So that's where the, the political angle comes in, because we need MDC MPs to really push for this in Parliament. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah. so, so what parliamentarians do, as you know, obviously, is to make law. Um, mm -hmm. So the law is there. If you look at Section 67 of the Constitution, every Zimbabwean has a right to vote, and that right is not subject to your location. Right. Um, and that's why ambassadors, for example, can vote even though they're in Germany or London or wherever it is. Right. So the question is, it's implementing that. So it's not necessarily a change in the law that's required per se, right. but a change in the approach of the electoral management oh, okay. body. And, you know, if you need that, you know, put in black and white in a, a piece of legislation, that can happen. But I think the first step is for the political willpower to be there. Mm. Okay. Enough That's to be made. And also, you know, um, you know I, I saw government officials coming to London from time to time. And, you know, obviously it's attractive to talk about business and trade and opportunities and so on. But, mm -hmm. you know, I wish there could be more talk about the diaspora vote, you know, take them to task. If uh, General Moyo comes to London, or I think right now it's Colonel Katsande, who's the ambassador, I think people need to literally sit on him and say, you know, what's going on? We demand the vote. The constitution gives it to us. We're not mm. going to back down with this. Mm. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fair. I mean, we, I'm aware. I'm aware of our time. So we just had just a few more questions. It won't take. It won't take. It won't take uh, plenty of time. We wanted to do like a bit of a. A rapid lightning just to kind of loosen things up sure. <laughs> so um, 
myself and that will ask you a question each. So you need to, you need to kind of pick one. So just whatever of your head, like you know, what's your your, your preference? Sure. So go for it. We we'll start a Cervita or Mazoe. Oh, Cervita. <laughs> what flavor? What flavor? Do you like um, corn and wheat? Because it, it's like a, an imitation of Cerelax. So very nice. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so get rid of one. So you have to pick one to get rid of. Um, yes. Wasabi mix or lemon creams? Ah, oh, tough one. <laughs> Wasabi mix. They're both hideous in my view. <laughs> Wasabi mix is just so mom when it comes to cooking. It's like, use your herbs. Use your, you know. Um, it yeah, is the worst thing that has so, happened to Zimbabwe. It's the worst. And it used to be like so staple. It's like, we're so unimaginative. And funny story, I was in West Africa earlier this year. Um, I was in Monrovia for a conference and their food is just mm. unbelievably yeah. delicious. I was yeah. just like, well, we're stuck in Wasabi Mix. They are here. <laughs> <laughs> so Wasabi Mix must go. Okay. Um, yeah. Texting or talking? Do you depends. prefer like... Um, depends. If it's work, texting. Okay. If it's someone I actually care about um, and have a personal relationship with, talking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Twitter or Facebook? Twitter. <laughs> Twitter has just got wider reach, man. And Facebook is great, but Twitter is life-giving. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite song right now? Um, you're going to laugh, and it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, Whitney Houston's The Greatest Love of All. And Ooh. how she talks about how, you know, loving yourself is the greatest love of all. Yes. Um, love, love. Yeah. That's my favorite song right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, what did you last watch on Netflix? Uh, the Last Dance. Ah. So I'm now just seven and eight, episode seven and eight. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, last question on that round is neurologists or engineers? Neurologist. <laughs> <laughs> only because, only because, only because um, they're just so interesting. I mean, I'm sure you've always wondered how your brain works. It's interesting to hear how your brain works. So, has your subject matter in that field increased recently? <laughs> Stop trying to be smart. Um, <laughs> yes, I am texting, Lena, and if that's your question, I can answer it directly. And like I said, it's just mind-blowing. It's, yeah, it's an interesting, like I didn't ever think, you know, I could learn anything new from another, but I was like, oh, interesting, interesting. Okay. Anyway, let's see. <laughs> We're rooting for you. We're rooting for everything. Thank you. Well, he needs the rooting for, I'm good. Um, I yeah. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, and then, kind of, our last question is um, sure. in regards to your goals. Like, what are you? What do you? Where do you see yourself in the next five years, ten years, whichever you, you can pick? So, um, normally, you know, when people ask, "What's your goal? What are you aiming for?" People think of like a position or a station in life. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to be a judge or I want to be a so and so for me it's just more about living my purpose mm -hmm. and ensuring that I'm living a life of meaning and that I'm in touch with that side of myself internally and that I'm fulfilled and satisfied that's the goal um because you know I've taken the path that I have um mm -hmm. that will likely find its expression in politics and law together one way or the other, either I'm practicing law or I'm, you know, making law as the case may be. But it's for me about reaching my full potential and doing the most I can to serve others and, you know, inspire hope and a thirst for change. Love that. Okay. Just one more. Sure. So I know you've sort of answered it in a roundabout way. Sure. <laughs> um, do you have any presidential aspirations? No. No? no, 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 certainly not right now. <laughs> no, no. Oh, okay. No, yeah, no. 
No, that's no. Good. And the reason I, you know what, I just want to, and I've said before to you know my colleagues um, in politics that I, I really don't care who gets the glory. So you mm. could give me no political post at all. And I would still find ways to make my voice heard and make an impact. Mm. So, you know, whether it's in my community, I'm still madly in love with Mount Pleasant, by the way. And whenever I can help, I do help. You know, it wasn't ever, and it will never be about the political position, but it's about doing everything I can personally to drive social change. Mm. And I've learned that informal authority is way more important for that purpose than formal authority. So it's not about being called the member of parliament. It's deeper than that. It's about seeing how you can make an impact on people's lives and influence people towards positive change. So with that background, you know, I don't need to be president in order to fulfill my ambitions to drive social change. That's amazing. No, thank you. Thank you. You, it's, been like, it's been lovely. Thank you so much, Nat and Michelle. Thank you for giving me so much to think about. <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure. So thank you so, so much. And please stay safe. I know you're in London, which is a bit of a hot spot. So let's, let's be safe, ladies. And hopefully you'll be able to come to Zim sometime yeah. in the not too distant future and we can have Absolutely. a cup of coffee. Indeed, that'll be amazing. How are your Absolutely. devil lessons going? Oh, they're going well, but I forget. <laughs> <laughs> they're going right. well, they're going well. Like my teacher's always on my case. Um, yeah, they're going well. And you know, I, I have to say that, you know, that's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. You know, we, you know, Shauna Privilege does make us think that everybody is Shauna. And I've gone to Bulawayo for, to court. I go approximately once a month um, for the Supreme Court circuit or for a high court trial or the labor court. And I'm always embarrassed that I meet an older lady or a police officer and I'm like, Ma, nani, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you, you also can't say good morning, you know? So I was just like, I really need to do better. I won't get it right every time, but that's fine. All you need to do is make an effort. Um, mm -hmm. And also when I'm in Bulawayo and I'm asking for directions or need to get something from the pharmacy, I just assume everyone speaks Shona, which is just unacceptable again. You know, we yeah. are one people. And, you know, if anything, we should be finding ways to converge and not to further divide each other. Yeah. Okay, hopefully we will see you in Zim, in Wulawayo. You're welcome at any point. Thank and for you Dai, so it's, much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Take care, ladies. Okay.